<laughs> well, thank you very much for having me tonight. After that wonderful introduction, I will I will try to live up to it and be as interesting as I can. Um, and actually, we we are getting some some fairly exciting news recently, which is that um, I'm wearing those two hats at the moment, being the general manager of Coastal and Ocean Resources, who is the current home of Shore Zone, but we're actually planning to transition that home to Sea Change Marine Conservation Society. So we're putting together a um, agreement with the parent company of Coastal and Ocean Resources to actually move Shore Zone, the intellectual property, over to Sea Change so we can run it as a social enterprise that would then support Sea Change's uh, important conservation, restoration, and educational work. So uh, some big, really um, exciting and slightly nerve-wracking changes going on over the next couple of months. We're sort of in the process of negotiating how well that's going to happen. So some exciting changes for Sea Change coming up. It's not going to change any way in how you access the data or what the data looks like. So everything that I'm talking to you about tonight is all still going to be completely relevant, but uh, we're just excited that Shore Zone will find that new home. And uh, in my mind, we'll finally be in the nonprofit world where I feel like it's belonged for a very long time. So it's exciting for me. Um, so let me just share my screen and we can, there we go. Hear that. All right, can everyone see that? My little Shore Zone 101? All right, awesome. Um, so Shore Zone is, I think, way predates my uh, involvement with it. So actually my very, well, I think my second job in biology was doing shore zone mapping at Archipelago Marine Research. And that was where I met uh, a wonderful biologist named Mary Morris, who developed the biological side of shore zone. And I also got to know her partner, uh, John Harper, who developed the physical side of shore zone um, way back in the Oh, I guess the 70s and 80s, and that was in conjunction with some other uh, geographers and geomorphologists in BC. So Shore Zone has actually been around for about 40 years, <laughs> which is a, a, an immense legacy to leave. And let me just make sure I can actually advance my slides. There we go. So I guess the big question though is what is Shore Zone? So Shore Zone is a standardized way of taking imagery of the coastline and then mapping that imagery and pulling mapping data out of it so that we're characterizing both the physical and biological attributes. So we're looking at, at uh, you know, the, the sediment, the environment, but we're also looking at what's living there. And the whole idea behind it is it goes into a database that is completely geo-referenced and searchable. So what it's searchable means that if we put an attribute in saying, hey, this is a boulder beach over here, you will be able to go in and find exactly where that beach is and find all the other beaches that share those same attributes. So it's it's placing these things in space as well as just talking about the characteristics. The way that we collect shore zone imagery is we fly mostly in helicopters. We used to use fixed wing aircraft at time, but to be honest with you, we found helicopters just work a lot better because we fly a lot of very complex pieces of coastline and uh, can respond to the, the changes in the coastline a lot faster. Um, we're flying at a nice low altitude, about 300 feet up and about 300 feet out from the low water line. So we're looking obliquely down into the intertidal zone. And we're flying at the lowest tides possible, usually it's one of the lowest tide windows, daylight low tide windows of the year. We'd love to be able to do this all year round, but we're actually pretty um, constrained to between about May and about August. Uh, and there's usually maybe two tide windows in each of those months that we could potentially work. So it's uh, it's kind of funny because we we very distinctly limit our our field season, <laughs> but we do that so that we can actually see the full extent of the intertidal zone. Um, we take both video and still photos. So in the helicopter, we have a four person team. We've got the pilot. Um, we've got a biologist who sits beside them, and up until recently, that's just been me. And Mary Morris was doing that before. We've had people from NOAA doing that. We've had lots of other other people doing that. Um, and that person is taking the photos and providing commentary uh, that's being recorded on the video about the biology that they see. And then sitting in the back seat, we've got a navigator who keeps us uh, going where we need to go. And we've got a GPS that is taking positional fixes on the helicopter every second. So as we're flying along, we've got a track line that shows exactly where we've been. 
And then beside them, sitting next to that other open door, because you see we actually take the doors off on the side of the helicopter that we're imaging on, or at least we usually do. Occasionally we get a nice helicopter that has big picture windows that we can open and take them through. That's always nice, especially when it's cold or rainy outside. But most of the time we take the doors off and uh, they're taking, as a geomorphologist sitting there, who's taking the video and providing commentary on all the physical attributes that, that we can see. And that commentary is used for our mappers back in the office to, to help interpret the imagery. So once we've got all that imagery, we actually go through and we grab a digital high water line. I'll show you what this looks like in, in just a little bit because it's kind of hard to picture it at first. But the, the high water line on any given shore, so if you sort of look at this shoreline and where my cursor is, you can kind of see that the high water line, see here's some, uh, there's some characteristics that can tell you where approximately the high water line is, where the splash zone. So the upper edge of the barnacle and where this uh, black lichen begins is a pretty good, right Right about, you know, the uh, lower edge of that log line is where that high water line is going to be. And so we find a digital representation of that. And we break the coastline up into what we call units. And each one of these units is a relatively homogeneous chunk of shoreline, and that's based on the physical characteristics. So we might have, for example, this rocky headland right here. This would be one unit. And then this beach in here, it's nice cobble boulder beach, would be another unit. And this headland, which sort of has this beach berm on top and then a rock ramp below, that's going to be another one. So as we look at this, like we're trying to, to uh, put together pieces of the shoreline that all look approximately the same. And within that, of course, there's always a little bit of variation. Um, and then we put a whole bunch of physical attributes on top of that. We describe the substrate. Is it sand? Is it pebble? Is it cobble, boulder, rock? Um, we're talking about the slope. The slope, I would say, is probably one of the things we are hard, it's hardest to do from the imagery because you're looking down obliquely. Um, it, it, you can usually tell if something's a bit steeper than something else, but you know, putting an actual uh, you know number on it can be a bit challenging. Um, we put the wave exposure in. So how long would the wind have to travel over water to get to this piece of shoreline? So that can affect how much wave energy is going to reach this piece of shore. Um, we look at shoreline modifications. Is there a, a seawall in there? Is there a riprap? Uh, you know. A, structure? Is there a wharf? Is there a boat ramp? So we classify all of those. Um, we also look at things like uh, co what we call coastal class. It's sort of a rolled together, which provides a summary of the overall habitat in here. We look at the geomorphology. Is it a beach face? Is it a tidal flat? Is it a, a cliff versus a ramp? And we have definitions for all of these different attributes, which are in a written protocol that's publicly available. So anyone who wants to look at this data set can go ahead and figure out what all of this means. So that's the physical side of it. And we have a team in our office who maps the physical side of it. And then they hand it over to our biologists, of which I am one. And our biology in shore zone is recorded as what we call biobands. And this is what Mary Morris came up with, um, which is a really uh, amazing way of recording it. Because of course, all of us know being uh, working in the marine world, if you start at the top of a beach and you walk down towards the water, you're going to walk through zones of vegetation and invertebrates um, and, and anything else that might be attached to the rocks. You're going to see that obviously that's dependent on, on desiccation, you know, resistance to desiccation. So the tide height is, is very important in determining what is the dominant part of that community in that, that part of the beach. Um, so we look at this imagery and we say, okay, we're defining an assemblage based on a typical tide height, color, and texture. So at the very, very top, so above the high water line, we've got things like salt marsh and dune grass and uh, what we call black lichen, which occurs, it's a lichen that occurs in the splash zone, really loves salt, um, but of course can't be underwater for a long time. So it occurs, it's a really nice way of actually figuring out where the high water line is on the beach. Um, and then you've got your, your barnacle, your rockweed, um, and in the mid intertidal you've got more your green algae and, and red algae and then right at the water line you're going to see things like eelgrass and kelps. This is obviously an extremely nice example of what this looks like. <laughs> Most beaches aren't quite this clear cut, um, but we certainly are able to characterize very large extents of the coastline 
um, in a way that uh, is easy to understand for a lot of other people look at it. It's very repeatable over a large area. We can't say with any certainty usually that a particular species is on that beach. I mean, other than rock, we can say, okay, we can see rock because of the fucus. We can see that there. But you know that the exact species of green algae is going to vary depending on your geographic area. It's going to vary depending on your wave exposure. So um, sometimes we are actually able to go out there and, and get ground data where we'll actually go to a bunch of different beaches in an area. And within each of these bio bands, which will stand on the beach and we'll look at the imagery and we'll say, okay, this is, this is where we define this bio band. What are the species on this beach? What is this wave exposure? And doing that, we're actually able to then um, talk a bit more about, okay, what species might be on what particular kind of beach. So it's a modeling exercise that can be done. And I'll give some examples of projects that have done that in the past using tourism data. Um, so Shorezone currently exists um, across about 122,000 kilometers of the Pacific Northwest. So uh, pretty much exactly where NAME operates. Um, we've got Oregon, Washington State, BC, and the vast majority of Alaska. You'll see there's a couple islands out here that we have not managed to get to yet out in the, uh, the Western and Central Aleutians and the Pribilof Islands out here in the middle of the Bering Sea. Hard to get to places. Um, we had a lot of fun imaging the Eastern Aleutians uh, when we went there, but it's it's even less settled and even harder to get to when the weather gets a little more interesting out here. So we're we're still hoping to get there one of these days because it's such a beautiful, amazing uh, area. Although nobody told me that one of the biggest um, hazards out here are feral cows. So we actually were told on a number of occasions that um, if you land on the beach and you see the cows, just don't don't interact with them, don't get anywhere close to them, they'll bite. So <laughs> that was that was an interesting one. Um, but there was a, a lot of uh, it's it just a lot of so an amazing range of shorelines, an amazing range of of habitats and climates and. Um, different areas that we've seen with shore zone over the years so it's it's a pretty amazing resource now obviously all of these were done over a 40-year time span so not all of these were taken at the same time so it's sort of each individual search uh, survey is a little snapshot of that particular place at that point in time but one of the exciting things is, is that we've actually recently started re-imaging and remapping some of these areas so for example the north coast of british columbia here this is around prince rupert um we actually originally imaged and, and mapped that in, in 2000. And then in between 2014 and 2019, we went back and redid that. And so we have a, a, an interesting now, these two sets of imagery and two sets of mapping that show this difference in that time. And there's actually been quite some quite pronounced differences, it turns out, that have been happening and that are actually quite uh, visible from the shore zone imagery and mapping. I'll give you some examples of that a little bit later as well, so I can show you some of those. But it's, it's neat because it's kind of turning shore zone from just an inventory tool, which is still an extremely important. If you don't know where things are and how much of it you have, it's very hard to manage anything effectively. So shore zone kind of fills this gap in a very hard to work in uh, large linear area. Um, but now it's also potentially going to be a monitoring tool for change over time. And we're really excited by that, that particular change. Um, so I just want to give you some examples of how people have used shore zone data. And uh, oil spill planning and response was actually the original use uh, for shore zone. It was originally why it was developed by um, John Harper and a team from the BC Ministry of the Environment. And some of the ways it's been used, for example, the Marathasa spill, I don't know if any of you are around the lower mainland, I uh, remember that from a, a number of years back, but the Marathasa uh, diesel spill in the in Burrard Inlet was a very visible um, and a very public place. Um, and some of the mapping there actually sort of highlighted the fact that the mapping needed to be updated in um, Vancouver as well. But having um, daylight low tide imagery from some very remote parts of the coastline. It's actually what's what's called a situational awareness tool. So it allows um, responders before they even get on the ground, you know, if oil goes in the water at 11 o'clock at night in November, nobody's going to be able to send a boat out until at least the next morning to go take a look at it. But with shore zone data, they can immediately take a look at the nearby shoreline, 
see uh, what that piece of the shoreline looks like. They can see where boats could land potentially. And also ShoreZone does provide some information about sensitivity to oiling. So they can actually get a, a very good idea of, of where the high priority areas might be. Um, one kind of neat way that shore zone was used up in Kodiak Island, the Kulik oil rig here was being towed down from the North Slope um, and broke free of its tugboats during a storm. It was drifting into the, the land and they did not want it to break up. Um, and so what they actually did was use the shore zone imagery to find a nice sediment beach. They realized they weren't gonna be able to tow it off because the waves were too strong. So they actually found a nice sediment beach using the shore zone imagery and pushed it up onto the beach in that section so that it stayed there. It remained completely in one piece for the whole storm and they were able to tow it off again afterwards. So, um, because there's lots of that shoreline and it's very, very rocky. So they found a place where it was gonna be nice and safe for the remainder of the storm. So that was kind of one of the, the neat ways that, uh, you know, just having this kind of tool is a really, really important thing for first responders. Um, some other ways, uh, one thing that shore zone does record is log debris. So log lines, you know, we know that they're ubiquitous on the beaches, but one thing you can always tell is that where there's a lot of logs, there's also a lot of marine debris. So the two of them tend to go hand in hand. So we've had some people in more remote parts of the world. This is up in the Bering Sea um who wanted to get a, a focused intensive cleanup effort going on but of course they weren't sure exactly where to go so they used the shore zone data to actually model catcher beaches um, where they might see accumulations of marine debris they went in they targeted those beaches for cleanup and then airlifted everything out afterwards so it it uh, saved a lot of time and effort in the planning process ahead of time um one thing we started doing when we moved into the um, Bering Sea and the North Slope was looking at coastal vulnerability, which is obviously a huge issue, um, particularly for those communities in there where it's a lot of soft sediment shorelines that would usually be protected from the winter storms by the ice cover. But of course, the ice cover is now occurring over a much shorter period of time. Um, and this, for example, is the community of Kivalina. Um, and Kivalina is actually having to be relocated. They've been trying to shore up the shoreline for years, but it's just not working. Um, and you can see it's an extremely vulnerable little piece of land. Um, and uh, one thing ShoreZone has been doing is providing some idea of how vulnerable a piece of shoreline might be to uh, sea level rise, whether that's from um, storm surge or from just basic sea level rise or other. So we, we see any, if there's any evidence of flooding or any evidence of erosion going on, we'll record that in the data set. Um, cultural features mapping was kind of a neat one that we, we've done some work with some of the First Nations in BC on. Um, Shore zone itself doesn't, we don't record any cultural features because we don't feel that that is our, we don't have any right to that data really. And particularly don't want that in a searchable public format. So we feel that nations have, have the right to decide who has that information and how it might be made available. Um, so we don't record anything, but in the shore zone imagery, a lot of uh, cultural features such as clam gardens, middens, fish traps, canoe runs, actually really, really clear. Um, just from the, the angle, even old village sites, um, I think there were some root gardens that were, you could just see the difference in the vegetation, so the more mature vegetation versus the vegetation that had been disturbed in the last hundred years. There's actually very distinctive ways of being able to determine that. So we actually work, have worked with a couple of different um, First Nations. This is an example from the Metlakatla First Nation up near Prince Rupert, um, where we actually uh, sort of set up an internal app where someone within the nation worked with an archaeologist uh, to recognize these features and record them. And so it was actually a, um, a capacity building exercise within the nation that, that we sort of helped set them up, but then they actually did the work themselves of recording these features. And it was actually a way of, of proving um, use of the intertidal zone um, for a legal capacity. Um, and in, in treaty negotiations of saying, look, here's all of these features and we can say, yes, we can clearly see that this, these areas were used and it was used all the way down to the, the low water line. Um, so that was, a, that was a pretty project and we've done that with a, a couple of First Nations in BC. Um, we talked about some of that species modeling. We've also done a lot of habitat modeling. So uh, green crab, obviously a big issue pretty much everywhere. Um, 
just discovered how how much it's moving in and around Victoria now. It's uh, just terrifying. These little guys are just like ravenous little locusts that come along and eat everything in their path and pull up all the eelgrass. Um, but basically, so this was Lynn Canal up in Alaska. So there was concern that it might be moving in. So what we did was we actually took the characteristics of beaches where green crab were known to exist um, in BC. And we pulled out the common shore zone characteristics for those beaches. And then we modeled other beaches that have those same characteristics and sort of ranked them according to how vulnerable they might be or how appealing they might be to an invasive green crab population so that those particular beaches could be targeted for monitoring. Um, and actually it looks like we might be doing that again with Alaska because uh, some people in Alaska, because it's, it's suddenly become another concern. They've started finding some green crab up there. So, um, and another one we've done is forage fish modeling. So this was actually an exercise done with the World Wildlife Fund um, where we actually took on the ground forage fish spawning data. Um, so egg counts that were done on the ground. And again, we looked at, okay, what were the common characteristics uh, of these beaches where forage fish were found to have spawned and which other beaches might share those same characteristics. And so we modeled them so that they could potentially be monitored uh, for, for forage fish spawning. Some of these we were able to rule out afterwards um, and sort of refine the model. The neat thing is the more ground data that we have and the more on the ground data, the more that we can um, make those queries more specific and actually pull up the data. But Shorezone is a great way to take those sort of data sets where, you know, on the ground monitoring is, is very time intensive and resource intensive. And this is a way to kind of expand the impact of that to a wider area um, because Shore Zone provides data over a much larger area, it provides over the thousands of kilometers, you know, hundreds and thousands of kilometers rather than just tens of kilometers. So it's a neat way to sort of expand the impact of, of those more intensive, labor intensive uh, surveys. Um, this was kind of a neat study uh, from a group at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where they were looking at um, the impact that sea otters had on the health of eelgrass beds. And it was really quite interesting um, that it turned out that uh, otters actually are very good for eelgrass beds. They're, they're good for the health of eelgrass beds. And it was quite fascinating where they were trying to, they were actually showing a correlation of the distribution of eelgrass in Southeast Alaska with the um, occurrence of sea otters um, in that area. So it was kind of, I had not quite realized that uh, those two things were would have quite that symbiotic. I, I knew that, you know, about the connection between otters and kelp beds, that's sort of been long established, but it turns out that otters and, and eelgrass beds are quite heavily intertwined as well. So that was a pretty neat one. Um, this was some work done by uh, a gentleman named Sam Starko. He's got his uh, PhD from UVic. He's actually now doing a postdoc in Australia. Um, and he actually, and, and uh, Chris Newfeld from the Banfield Marine Sciences Center, and um, we're just doing some more studies on shores and they were actually looking at some of these, uh, I'd pointed to them some areas on the North Coast where we could see some widespread areas that kelp was disappearing. Um, and they were actually working up some of that data. So it's really exciting to see that, that they're sort of continuing to work with the shore zone data. But they were looking here at Barkley Sound, which is on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And they were looking at old um, uh, 2007 shore zone survey and sheen where kelp, so the, the blue areas are where kelp is present and the red is where kelp is absent. And you can see between 2007 and 2018, where they actually went out and did boat surveys, that the kelps have been disappearing um, canopy kelps in this case, giant kelp and bull kelp, and disappearing from further into Berkeley Sound. And they were able to correlate that with the temperature anomaly so that they could tell that these coves and bays where it was disappearing from were um, increasingly much warmer. The surface, what temperatures were much warmer than those sort of closer to the outer coast where it got more, I think, exchange with the, the outer Pacific. So that was a really neat Neat one. Um, this is uh, the way area I actually talked to them about. So this is the Green Island Lighthouse um, up in uh, Chatham Sound near uh, Prince Rupert. And uh, you can see this was our original shore zone photo from 2000. Uh, we flew this in June 2000. And you can see there's this beautiful, it's, it's kind of hard, I have to lighten this up. I played with this slide so many times. Um, but you can see that there's this lovely kelp bed 
um, it's a big bull kelp kelp bed. And so we reflew that area in 2019. So you can see I can actually line them up. And the kelp uh, has all been eaten by sea urchins. I mean, it's just, it's turned into an urchin barren um, in that 19 year period. And this was actually the case over a very large area of the North Coast. It was quite startling because when we started re-imaging the North Coast in 2014, it was before sea star wasting disease became quite prevalent. Um, and then sea star wasting disease hit its peak around 2016, 2017. And we did this just after that. And it turns out that the sunflower stars were almost completely, um, were just decimated on the North Coast. And it turns out they were keeping the urchins in check after, of course, sea otters were removed from the ecosystem about 200 years ago. Uh, turns out there was another balance on that that uh, then completely shifted out of balance. So it's, um, yeah, it was, it was an application for shore zone, but very disturbing to see. <laughs> and this is actually, so Sam Starko, uh, the gentleman who's doing the Berkeley Sound study was actually putting together some data on this. So I'm really excited to see the publication he's putting together. Um, so this just shows again, this is distribution of, um, this is the actual mapping of that same area. So this is the Green Island Lighthouse. And this is showing the orange is the, you can see that there's two different digital high water lines. It's a bit of a challenge when trying to compare this data over time. Um, but you can actually see that the orange here is the 2000 shore zone mapping. And this is showing that there was continuous bull kelp recorded here in 2000. Um, and then in, so, the, so this is the 2000, and then this is the 2000. Sorry, this is a, a bit of a challenge. And so this is Sarah, we just water. had a quick. Oh, we yes. just had a quick question. Uh, was Absolutely. that the same time of the year? Yes, they were both done in June. So yeah, they're very comparable, very comparable times. So yeah, we can kind of see this is the digital shoreline. So you can see the digital shoreline, what we attach it to does get better. But then here we actually see the bull kelp in 2000. It was continuous, completely continuous around the island. And then in 2019, we only found it, I think that we had one bull kelp bed and it was just tucked into this little bay right over here. So it used to completely surround the island and now it's uh, it does not. So that was a really interesting way in that it, it really sort of provided a good example of how the shore zone imagery and mapping could be used to look at change over time. So that is my presentation. I actually did want to take you guys really quickly to the um, one of the shore zone websites. So there's any number of different places that you can access this data. Um, for BC, we have the BC shore zone ArcGIS site. And I'll, I'll show you guys what that looks like in just a minute. Uh, for those of you from the States, there is a NOAA shore zone site, um, the AUS portal, which is the Alaska Ocean Observing System portal. It's also available, the BC data is available from the shortest Strait of Georgia data center and through what's called the EMSA portal, although I think that one you need an invitation to, um, to access, but that's the Emergency Management Situation Awareness Portal put together by Transport Canada. So there's a lot of different places and every, image that's ever been taken, all of the mapping data is all available for both viewing and downloading online. So it's a terrific resource for educators uh, because it provides people a terrific way to see with their own eyes what a particular piece of shoreline might look like. You can go out there and I think we added it up one time, it would take over 50 days to watch all of the video continuously <laughs> that we've taken over that time. Um, and we have hundreds of thousands of high resolution photos. Admittedly, some of the stuff from the 90s and early 2000s is not quite as high resolution as, as our, our more recent. Um, and we actually have had things like, um, there was an art exhibit that was actually done uh, where a number of, in uh, Anchorage, I think a number of uh, local artists were given some shore zone photos and they were, they painted some artwork inspired by those shore zone photos. And then the, the shore zone photos and the artwork were displayed in an art gallery, um, sort of bring awareness to, you know, to, it was called a coastal impressions uh, exhibition. So it was really, it's been some really neat ways. We've had kayakers um, tell us that they now plan all of their kayaking trips using shore zone imagery because they're able to go out and find good beaches that they can land on and you know, able to see, you know, what areas they they might want to go explore. So it's it's just a really neat tool. Um, and to show you what that looks like, I'm just going to really uh, quickly move over to the screen. 
And I just wanted to add that Sarah has said she's going to make her presentation available and we'll put that on the website. So all of yes. the links will be available in her presentation. So if you see anything go by, just know that you'll be able to access it once we're done. Yes, absolutely. Uh, can you guys see the website now? I just tried to move screen. Okay, I can't do it. Okay. <laughs> so this is the ShoreZone ArcGIS site. At the moment, this is administered by Coastal and Ocean Resources, but this will move over to Sea Change. Um, we don't anticipate any interruption in that, so hopefully we'll just be able to make a very nice, smooth transition. Either way, the data will continue to be available. Um, it's I should say that all of this ShoreZone data um, has been funded by over 70 partners. Um, federal government agencies, provincial state government agencies, um, First Nations, port authorities, we've had a few private funders, not too many, um, academic institutions, um, tribal organizations, so it's been a really tremendous um, effort over the years um, that people have had, and it's really it's really why I'm really thrilled to be having this come to a nonprofit organization who's mission is to you know to ensure this data and that you know that for educational purposes and everything else this data stays out there and stays in the public domain and is is always accessible so that's very exciting for me as well it makes me always feel a bit not that you know it was in danger of that before but when you're owned by a a large company that is more motivated by profit you just you know always want to make sure the priorities aren't going to change so <laughs> Um, so as you can see here, this is the data. So and this is the same. If you go to um, the NOAA Shore Zone portal, it doesn't look quite the same, but it works in a similar fashion. So just to you know that accessing the, the American and the, the Alaska and Washington State and Oregon data is going to be a similar kind of experience. So let's just zoom in. We'll go around Prince Rupert since it's I'm just going to zoom in here. So when you get close enough, you'll start to get these little lines all popping up. So these are the helicopter track lines. And you can see if we click on here, we get all the different layers that are available. And you can see that there are two different, um, if we look at the legend, there's two different, oops, sorry, legend. Um, there's several different uh, vintages of imagery here. So the green is showing the uh, imagery from what we call the historical, and that's anything pre 2000. So then the um, blue and the red is showing anything uh, post 2000. Let me just take a few of these off because there's not all of these that we need on here. So if we want to, I'm just going to take off the historic as well. So it makes it a little bit easier to look at. So if you want to look at, let's say we're going to look at, um, oh, let's see these islands out here. So when you click at any point on this track line, it's going to pop up with a couple of different uh, options here. One is you can play the video. So let's just go take a look at the video. It's going to take you to Vimeo. We've got it on Vimeo because it's a relatively um, stable platform. Um, and so there you go. So at that point, you're going to have the video. Whoops. Of course, it always does this to me every time I'm trying to demonstrate to someone. No, go away. <laughs> Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Every once in a while, Vimeo likes to play play tricks on me. So, but where you're clicking from that point on the map, that's actually where the video will start playing. So it's all, as I said, geo-referenced, all starts uh, showing you what that particular piece of coastline might look like. And then you can also go to, if you clicked on one of the red points, these are the photos. So you can click on that photo and it takes you to the Flickr site for BC. And again, you're looking at the photo from that point in space. And you can see these are really lovely high resolution photos. You can zoom right in. You can see all the lovely kelps. And we've got some sea grasses. There's some surf grass there. And reds and greens and all kinds of good stuff there. So this is a really, um, if you ever need any photos for anything, these are all for download. You've got a little button right there. You can download it. All that we ask is that you credit uh, ShoreZone. Um, if you can put a link to the, the website where you accessed it from, just like the ShoreZone ArcGIS site, that's great. Otherwise, if you just credit it as, as being from ShoreZone, that, that's all we need because it said it's, it, the data itself is actually owned by many different partners, all of whom who have agreed to put this in the public domain. So if you want, you can just scroll through. If you want to find a really good example of... Uh, Let's say you're looking for a photo of eelgrass for a presentation. The neat thing is, is that's a really easy way to find that. So 
if you want to go to eelgrass let's click on the eelgrass there so where have we got eelgrass great let's zoom in what i know is a particularly nice example <laughs> so here we've got this is saying there is eelgrass along this particular section it's a nice continuous band so let's go find some photos from that point so we're just going to click on that photo and there we have it this is scroll through there we go you guys can probably not see it as easily as me i'm so used to looking at these photos i'm just going to keep going until we've turned around and we don't have the sunlight glaring off the <laughs> off the flat so you guys can actually see that a little bit better let's go back here we are so there's this lovely green across the flats here this is all eelgrass probably some nice green algae in there as well and then when we're coming back out we can see that nice eelgrass bed if we zoom in we can see that nice grassy texture in the near shore so if you want to actually find a nice picture of eelgrass or salt marsh there's some nice salt marsh if you want to show rockweed here's some rockweed all of those things you can find those um, and then go find the images of it if you want uh, right on the website. So uh, one thing we also have now, which is kind of cool, um, we only just recently started doing this uh, in the last couple of years is create um, some polygons. So obviously looking at shore zone as a linear data set is pretty cool, but of course the intertidal zone is not a linear feature. It's, it's, it's a nice big flat area. It's really three-dimensional, but the two dimensions really makes it a lot um, nicer to look at. So we actually found a digital low water line and we actually um, created a nice two dimensional a polygon data set. So we used the imagery with along with satellite imagery and you can now look at sort of any of these beaches and say, OK, so along this beach here, we've got, oh, there's a marsh at the top of the beach. And then this part is like oh, it's, a, oh, it's a rock platform. And then right at the water line is a nice little beach face. So it gives you a much more detailed description of what's there. And all that data was in shore zone to begin with, but we never had a way to display it properly. And of course, being able to display and visualize data is so important. So it was really great to be able to have the opportunity and have this nice high resolution imagery. And now we've got so much high resolution satellite imagery um, that it was really nice to be able to do that. And we also did then go and see if we could take some of what we call our sensitive habitat biobands and turn those into polygons. Bear in mind that we draw all these by hand. Um, so let me just turn on some of my bull kelp, giant kelp. Okay, so here we have giant kelp. Um, so you can see here that these are some areas. We have some nice giant kelp in here. These were, so these are, we always say it's a basically a rough um, size, uh, shape, and location. So this is giving you an idea of where there's a nice wide bed of giant kelp versus a little narrow. Um, bed of giant kelp. So, and if we zoom out a little bit more, we've got some nice big bull kelp around here. Um, so you can see as we zoom out that it creates this really much more idea of, of a very how complex and how amazing and how um, variable each piece of this the shoreline is. So this this polygon mapping exists for the north coast of BC and then a few spots down on the south coast. We've only just sort of started doing this in the last couple of years, so it's kind of an exciting new place for shore zone to be going as well. Again, just a better way to visualize the amazing variety that you get in a, in a, in a zone. For example, you know, over here, you can see now that there's this um, a unit over here that's actually anthropogenic. So this is actually a, a boat ramp over here, but we're actually able to visualize and show how much of the shoreline that takes up. So yeah, it's a really exciting new way for us to, to really be able to show shore zone data. I'm going to stop talking for a few minutes and I'm going to let you guys ask questions. And uh, I, as I said, I will provide all of this, um, all the links on how to get to this data and how to, to look at, you can actually download all of the, like the geo databases and stuff in the background as well. I'll provide links to all that so everyone can go have a look at it themselves. But if anyone has any questions, I'd love to, love to answer them. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, if you do have a question, you can feel free to either unmute yourself um, and ask it directly. Or um, if you're doing something where you can't unmute yourself, feel free to type it into the chat and I will pass it on uh, to Sarah. Does anyone have any questions about the shore zone, how to use it, how to find something or anything else that Sarah talked about? 
I have a question about the polygons just to get things going. Yeah, you bet. Um, so at this stage, could you um, sum up the area of, say, a particular polygon for the whole shore? Yep. So there is an area attached to each of these. Yeah. Um, we also have a density uh, estimation attached to each of them. So it's really just a qualitative at this point. So it was sort of a sparse, moderate, or dense. So for example, if you have a bulk out polygon, you get the area of that polygon. And if it's a dense polygon, it could give you some idea of how much, like a densely packed polygon, it could give you a really good idea. If it's a sparse polygon, you know that there's probably just you know, we've got a few little heads of bulk up here and there. It's really hard to draw a circle around each and every one of them. Um, so you might harness a whole area. So I think honestly, what we're hoping to work toward is if we can couple this with some ground data, we might be able to start giving an idea of biomass uh, in each of these polygons, dependent mm -hmm. on um, the density and the area estimations. But we still need a little bit more ground data, I think, before we can actually get to that point. So this is satellite data matched up with the time that the shore zone photos were taken or? We tried as close as we could. Um, it is impossible to find <laughs> satellite imagery that was taken at exactly the same time, mm -hmm. but we tried to find yeah. it as close as we could. The other issue being, because a lot of people have asked us, why don't you just use satellite imagery? But this part of it is that we couldn't get the biology. Um, and the second is that trying to time satellite imagery for low tide windows um, very challenging because um, you can't have any cloud cover. <laughs> of course, we're in BC. How often are you not going to have cloud cover <laughs> over such a large area? Um, so uh, we we basically used the best satellite we could, but mostly we used the satellite for positioning things in space as best we could. Um, but the shore zone imagery was what we really used to determine extents. Has Marcira been involved yet with uh, her spectral analysis and that kind of stuff? Not yet. We're hoping so. Marcira knows about this, and we've mm -hmm. we've chatted a couple of times about about the different kinds and, and maybe. And I know Marcira has used some of the shore zone imagery to do a little bit of ground truthing, but again, um, sometimes the the matching the satellite up exactly with the shore zone imagery, because of course both are just a snapshot of a point in time, um, mm -hmm. has been a little bit of a challenge. But yeah, I'm I'm hoping that we can do. Now that sort of, it was just a couple of years back that we actually just did a pilot doing this and it's it's taken off so fast and DFO has wanted to fund it that we haven't really had a chance to catch up um, on our methodology on it yet. So we've, we've got a little bit more work to do. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really excited on where it could where it could go and, and the kind of data it can provide. That's amazing set of data. Yeah. Cool. So I have anyone a, else? Go I ahead. Have one question. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to imagine in each of those months when you when you have to have an exact type, you have a, a bunch of helicopters going out on, <laughs> on those days up and down the coast or how? how well, we haven't, we haven't, we, we can field probably two teams if we, we had to, we have, um, we like to have pretty trained staff. We now have a few more staff trained now, which is great. Yeah. Um, but uh, more often than not, we've got maybe a couple of surveys, you know, two or three surveys each year. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it takes us quite a while to map all of that because yeah, we can, we can fly somewhere around 1,800 to 2,000 kilometers of shoreline in any, if we fill a full six day tide window, which we try to do because it's just yeah. cheaper to get us out there. Um, it takes us a while to map all that. So that's usually about what we can, we can handle. And we can always right. get more people and train more people to do yeah. mapping. But um, yeah, so we, you're usually just having uh, one team on the go at the time. There have been times in the past we've had, we've gotten yeah. two teams out there. That's but now amazing. Like Nova Scotia, because yeah. we just flew out there and, and started doing some on the East Coast. And we were there a week and a half before Hurricane Fiona hit. Um, which was making me very nervous because I'm like, <laughs> we were scheduled to go out there in like the early part of September. And I'm like, isn't that peak hurricane season? <laughs> so it was first time we've ever had to worry about a hurricane potentially scuttling a shore zone survey. Um, we've had snow, we've had all kinds of other stuff, but snow in April and the Aleutians. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we fortunately we sidestep that one. But the really interesting part, I've been talking with the, the DFO guys out there. I'm like, you know, I know there was a lot of changes to some of the soft sediment shorelines, you've got a kind of a really neat record of what the shoreline looked like just a week and a half before the storm hit. 
Um, imagine if we'd had that for PEI. I mean, I heard of, you know, some yeah. of the, they lost tens of meters of their dune systems um, in some of the parks and things like that. So it was just kind of, it was, it was just an interesting way that sort of brought home what having a record like this and how valuable it can be in, you know, an age when extreme events are becoming more and more yeah. common. And this has happened in the Bering Sea too, where there was a couple of communities where they, you know, in one storm, they lost 20 meters of coastline. Mm -hmm. um, I think like the road to the airport was, you know, just part of it just disappeared in this one small community. Um, and we were able to go back and find the shore zone imagery from a few years previously and see where it had previously sat. And that was how we were able to quantify how much of it was lost. So yeah, there's a, a, a lot of power in the images in taking those. Mm -hmm. Well, not only power in the images, but being able to organize them where you can find them again. I mean, yes. that's a big part. Yes. Organizing this much data over such a large area, it's been a challenge. Over <laughs> and over so much time, too. It's amazing. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's definitely some some issues we've had with the older older pieces of the data and trying to maintain that and try to, you know, ensure it doesn't get lost because it is such a valuable historic record. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's 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 been a challenge, but honestly, we sort of we've got it in a good place now, which is great because it's available through a number of different sources. And we're now talking with GFO about having maybe a full backup of the imagery on some of their servers, so we can make sure that never gets lost. Um, so because we've got lots of backups ourselves, but you know, <laughs> it's not quite the more the merrier. I always say. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a way of tracking how many, say, for example, educators are using the information or anything like that? Or is it just? I wish we did. We honestly, we, we mostly, you know, we usually get to hear about it eventually. Um, yeah. But it's amazing. I'll meet people. Uh, like when I sat down with the Sea Change Board, I remember when we were sitting down to discuss Shore Zone and the idea of this social enterprise. I was totally surprised. It seemed like almost every member of the board knew exactly what your was already. It's like, oh, I don't even need to tell you guys this. This is awesome. So it, it uh, continually surprises me. I mean, our ArcGIS site probably gets 20 to 30 hits every day um, wow. of people that's just in BC. And I know that it's a pretty similar number from NOAA. I've had people in the Coast Guard telling me they use it every day you know, up in Alaska and places like that. So it's it's a, a very well used data set, which is awesome. That's what we like wow. here. <laughs> but in terms of educators, I don't, I wish I did because it would be, I've given talks to the coastal geography class up at UVic before coming and giving them talks on the shore zone data set and things like that. But uh, so I know a lot of people up at UVic know about it, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to know how many educators would be <laughs> using it. Hi again. Hi, uh, Ava Qual. She's a geomorphologist in our department in geography. She's already been using the data for some time, and she's part of this Cleoquit uh, 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 Sound Field School that we've got coming up. Oh, lovely! So I'm, I'm really hoping. I'm hoping that we can uh, coax you to present to the field school that's happening up there. It's uh, six courses. The students actually live up in Tofino uh, oh, for wow. the full semester. Uh, and doing action-based community-engaged projects. It's oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah it really is. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> you won't have to twist my arm very hard to do that. So. <laughs> what program is that through? That clay quotes? The, uh, that's uh, the geography department at UVic. Oh, yeah, cool. we've done it a few <laughs> times before. I was uh, at, at one of the first ones. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be helping with the cool. community engaged action projects mm -hmm. on this, this particular field school. Yeah, we have Malia on uh, on the call as well. She's part of our community mapping class and we're just oh, itching to rope this in. To our <laughs> <class>. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, you know, everyone in the scientific world, you know, they call this a situational awareness tool. And I'm like, that's just a fancy way of saying an educational tool. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> really short yeah. on is just one big educational tool. So it's sort of like, you know, it, it's for a specific purpose, but you know, it to me is, is you're educating yourself about a piece of the shoreline when you go in and look at this data. Yeah. So I, I like to think we're all kind of educators in a way. <laughs> yep. 
I think it would be great to hear your talk at the um, conference next year. Like I, I, I think this would be a great, be great. Uh, talk for the, the audience that we have there. So hopefully you'll follow our, our social media and find out when the call for presentations yes, comes up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any talking other... about some of the challenges on the East Coast. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Sarah? Questions, I have comments? Another question, mm -hmm. If I may. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> um, we went to this, Gary was there as well. We went to this workshop from the oil spill people here in BC now. And I asked them about Shore Zone. They said they'd moved to a different, mm -hmm. their own oil spill sensitivity mapping tool. Do you know anything about that or what? There's or... Environment and Climate Change Canada? Well, uh, no, it was based in Oregon, I think they're. Oh, in Oregon. Yes, that's actually Shore Zone. <laughs> they just don't, they don't actually call it Shore Zone in Oregon, but it, it's, right. it's Shore Zone. Um, so yeah, they, Shore Zone and Washington State actually have their own portals for it. I've, I've met so many people from Washington State. They're like, that's so cool. Did you guys get that idea from Washington State? I'm like, eh. Actually, <laughs> we're the contractor did all that for you guys. <laughs> like, just don't call it your zone. Well, so, which is totally fine with us. I'm yeah. like, no problem. But it's yeah, it's it's kind of funny how um I don't know if they've moved to uh they've also do have a, a um ESI mapping, so environmental sensitivity index mapping in the states. Mm -hmm. Um, and it could be that they've redone that in Oregon, and that's sort of a different. It's a very similar data set um, in some ways in terms of the oil sensitivity portion of it, but it doesn't include any like biological data. Um, and it, it could be a little more specific. It can bring in a lot more data sets. It's neat in a way that brings it like, for example, bird um, rookeries are brought into that data set. So there's a more of a um, an expert uh, awareness of like where sensitive spots along the coast might be for things that you can't see in our imagery because you know we can you can see seals sometimes sea lions and things like that but you know our mapping isn't telling you about bird abundances or, or identifying birds or whales or anything like that so there's uh the neat thing is we found is this actually works quite well with other types of coastal mapping that tends to fill in some of the gaps um that sort of mapping with a more specific purpose like esi mapping uh tends to have so we don't tend to think of it as a competitor as so much as you know, another way of, and I always say the more mapping, the better, to be honest with you guys. <laughs> I think there's a lot of this, especially in sensitive parts of the coastline, but that's interesting. I'll have to look and see if they've done something else in Oregon that I'm not aware of, but I know that their previous oil spill response tool, um, the basis of that was shore zone mapping. Yeah, this was the, you know, those guys with the blue and orange boats that are parked all over the place now. And um, oil spill. Oh, WCMRC? Is that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah WCMRC. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, they use Shore Zone yeah. too. Yeah. They, uh... Cool. I've talked to them a number of times. They're nice guys. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, you have a question. Great. Kitty. Yeah. Um, uh, so have you started doing any of the work on the East Coast? And I'm wondering if the, uh, you know, the narrow or intertidal creates challenges for you. <laughs> or what other challenges there would be on the on a, on the east coast yeah there's quite a few we actually so we've taken the imagery we did a, a big survey around cape breton um and in the bradore lakes and the bradore lakes were certainly an interesting area compared to so the bradore lakes i don't know if you guys how familiar you guys are with cape breton i wasn't at all familiar with it before we went out there um but it's um these very constricted tidal inlets they're called lakes that drove, drove me nuts because they called a bunch of things lakes <laughs> or salt water and I'm like why are you calling them lakes <laughs> it's just confusing um so it's uh but they they have a very very like a 20 centimeter tide range oh. and it was kind of driving me a bit nuts because um it it was definitely hard to identify the intertidal zone in some ways <laughs> Um, and so it was mostly, but it, we could see a lot of the subtitle of vegetation. It turns out there's a lot of eelgrass in there. I, I didn't think it would be because it was so constricted. I assumed it would be a little bit more freshwater, but it was not at all. It was a very um, sort of, I guess, saltwater ecosystem that just had a, a more restricted circulation. And because of that, I was also expecting there wouldn't be a lot of eelgrass, but clearly something's circulating in there because there was lots. Um, so certainly that, the the 
width of the rockweed bioband was just kind of nuts. They've got about six <laughs> different species of rockweed out there, which I was not familiar with most of them. And they look a bit different from the Pacific Northwest. We've only got like two species here. Um, so it was a, it was a very different, different place and the lack of canopy kelps I found a bit strange as well because they don't have bull kelp they're giant because they don't have any of the, the big floating kelps and um, the kelp forest so I did find that a bit interesting but we're finding a um, an algae expert from the university out there University of New Brunswick who's going to sit down with us and look through some of the imagery so we can define the biobands appropriately because one of the nice thing about biobands is you can apply it to new areas like that as long as you are very clear on what your definition of those biobands are. And so I think the existing ones we have will translate nicely. We just want to make sure we're saying, okay, well, instead of, you know, Fucus testicus, which is the main species out here, um, we're actually looking at a, a couple, like there's an Ascophyllum, there's a couple different species on the East Coast, which are much more common, and we're definitely much more visible. But the rockery going into the subtitle was very strange to me, because um, I'm used to it being a very you know, just an upper intertidal species. So it was, it was definitely different seeing them, um, seeing the different uh, trends. And there was a, a lack of barnacle around it as well. And the barnacle was there, but it wasn't forming a band that was very clearly visible. So yeah, I think there's going to be some really neat differences we're going to be able to, um, to uh, point out once we sort of get that all, all mapped. Were you on the inner shores at all, like the Minas Basin side? doing that no so we we stopped right at, at um cape north i think it was called um and so we we're just at the moment working with the maritimes region um for department of fisheries and oceans which is basically from the the right where you go into the gulf of uh lauren the um, mm -hmm. St. Lawrence gulf and then down to eventually we'll get to the bay of fundy which i'm i'm looking forward to and not looking forward to because yeah. that <laughs> tide range I want to see it. But the it's other gonna, extreme. <laughs> it's got its own challenges where you've got a, like a 20 centimeter tide range to a 35 meter tide range. So um, that's going to be an interesting one um, to do as well. But we haven't quite haven't quite wrapped our brains around how to do that one. We might try and tackle it. Maybe not this upcoming year, but the year after. Um, but yeah, it's a really I, I, the the variation in the tide levels up and down just at what would be a fairly small portion of the coast is really it is definitely creating some interesting challenges but we're, we're, we're having fun working them out <laughs> to what extent can you start using drones you know we've we've really looked at at how drones can sort of fit into this and at the moment drones um are not reliable enough to really be able to collect the kind of imagery that rely on simply because for most commercially available, affordable drones, um, they can't handle the wind and the rain. Um, and also in Canada, you're legally required to have a line of sight on them. So you can't let the drone out of your sight, which means if you're trying to fly several hundred kilometers of shoreline in a day, um, you'd need something to follow along the drone. And so it it's at the moment, it's not, the technology is not quite there for this particular application. Um, but what we've actually found in working with a couple of different people is that if you need, so for example, if you need to monitor a particular bay or maybe a certain stretch of coastline, um, getting a helicopter out there to refly that, it just doesn't make any sense. Like the helicopter really only makes sense when you're flying a very large chunk, but drones would be really great for intensively monitoring smaller sections of coastline. And so we were actually working with DFO to see if, if drones could use the same methodology to collect similar imagery. And then you could actually do the mapping and monitoring more often, sort of like have the shore zone over the larger extent, but then if you're focusing more intensively, drones work really well for that and they're much more um, affordable. So I think we're sort of figuring out how the two technologies, the technologies can all work together. But at the moment, it's sort of two fairly separate applications. But you can get very similar imagery um, from drones that you can from. I guess helicopter. with drones, you can get, uh, you know, you can do the angle differently to give you yeah. good water penetration. Exactly. To get yeah. more of the subtitle. Yeah. And you're not yeah. flying along at 100 kilometers an hour. So mm -hmm. you can stop and look at stuff a little better, too. <laughs> 
Excellent. Well, you know, the other approach is to get the sea urchins to eat all the kelp, and it's nice, clear water. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. You can see right out of the rock. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Sarah? Yes, I have a question, Sarah. Gary, go ahead, yeah, Gary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were uh, considering how we could map the details on ecological reserves back when we were doing the work on oil spills. Um, because we have 19 reserves in the southern part of Vancouver Island alone. Right. And each one has a small uh, exposure to uh, the coastline. And do you have any layer that you can pick out uh, places like that? Like, for instance, do you have a layer for ecological reserves, a layer for bays, a layer for, uh, you know, docks or whatnot? Do you have, do you have layers for uh, units like that? Hmm. So our units are defined more based on physical characteristics, but having said that, we have, um, it's very quite straightforward to layer. Um, so for example, if we had a, a GIS layer that showed the boundaries of, of the reserves, so the ecological reserves, it would be fairly straightforward to superimpose that on the shore zone data and sort of cut out those little sections of it. Um, and we do have a layer of, of anthropogenic modifications or several layers actually that show things like docks and wharves and boat ramps and riprap and, and uh, different things like that. So it would certainly be possible to sort of pull a separate chunk of data that was just for those small areas. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, all we would need to do is find, we don't have anything like that on uh, this particular website, um, but we have worked with some areas to and some organizations sort of build custom websites so for their own their own purposes and sort of bring in data layers that are more specific to their particular needs so because the shore zone data is, is publicly accessible we just sort of you know pull those off of the the shore zone ArcGIS site and then can put a bunch of other layers on and and we've worked with um, I think it was the NISCA um, that we did sort of a community response tour, pulling in a bunch of different layers and different boundaries and, um, you know, fishing zones, fishing areas and things like that. And mm -hmm. uh, it worked, worked quite well. So uh, it certainly is possible. And another, another one would be rockfish conservation. Zone. Exactly. Exactly. Rockfish conservation mm -hmm. areas as well. Yeah. So, yeah, that's it's certainly all possible to do and, and um, would be a pretty straightforward. I think you can actually use what are called rest services to, um, sort of grab the shore zone layers and sort of pull them into your own ArcGIS application. Mm -hmm. um, so it, we're, we're trying to make it as straightforward as possible. We're looking at hopefully actually have providing some upgrades to the um, shore zone site in the near future that would make that a little more simpler and straightforward and maybe even have the capacity of adding your own layers onto this site just for your own personal use. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're looking at, at making it a bit more functional in terms of its um, power as an online tool. So yeah, that's hopefully coming soon. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you. No problem. Um, well, we are just about at the end of our time. And so I want to thank you, Sarah, for giving us such a great presentation tonight. Um, and I want to let everyone know that the recording will be up on the website. And like I say, that will have the links that Sarah talked about. Um, and we look forward to our next talk in December, which is going to be about king tides. So we hope that you'll join us next month to hear about king tides at our next virtual speaker series. So thanks, Sarah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Many thanks Thank you. very much. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. That was wonderful. Nice.